Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the August 12, 2022 California Board of Behavioral Sciences meeting. My name is Max Disposti. I'm the board chair. My pronouns are him and is, and I'm the chairperson of this board. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone that's present that the board is a consumer protection agency that is charged with administering and enforcing the board laws where protections of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protections of the public shall be paramount. The Board of Behavioral Sciences will be holding this public meeting in person and via WebEx platform. I will announce when our attack, we are accepting public comments on the various issues, and for each public comments period, we will first be accepting comments from the participant in the audience that are present here in the room. Then the moderator will open the lines as appropriate so that the remote audience members can comment as well. Each commentator will have two minutes to comment. And moderator, good morning to you. Would you please provide the audience instructions on how they may participate during the meeting at the appropriate time? So thank you. This is the moderator. Uh, and when the board calls for public comment, we, we will open up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public can either uh, click the Q&A button down at the lower right hand corner of their WebEx screen or use the raise hand function that is next to their name in WebEx. Uh, we'll go in the order that comments are received and once again, you'll be given two minutes to speak in a 15 second warning. Uh, when I re request to unmute your microphone, a prompt will appear on your device that says unmute me. You'll want to click unmute me so then you can speak um, and give your comment. At the end of the time, your microphone will be muted and then we'll move on to the next person who requests public comment. I believe that is all my instructions. Wonderful. Thank you so much as always. And now it's time for us to establish a quorum. And before the roll call, please introduce yourself and let the public know, this is for my fellow board member, if you are a public member or licensing member, uh, Christina Kitamura, if you can please call the roll and establish a quorum. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Ross Ehrlich. Present, public member. Abigail Ortega. Present, LCSW member. Justin Huff. Present, LMFT member. Yvette Casares willis Present, public member. Max Disposti. Present, public member, board chair. Christopher Jones. Present, LEP member, board vice chair. John Sovic. Present, LMFT, my pronouns are he, him. Dr. Annette Walker. Present, pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm a public board member. Kelly Ronasinghe. Present, public member, pronouns he, him. We have a quorum. Thank you. And then also I would like to allow our um, members of the staff to introduce themselves as well. Thank you. Marlon McManus, Assistant Executive Officer. Thank you. Steve Sodergren, Executive Officer. Sabina Knight, Legal Counsel for the Board. Roseanne Helms, Legislative Manager for the Board. Wonderful, thank you. And for those of you that are present here today, if you would like to come forward and introduce yourself as well. Hello. <laughs> You're more than welcome to introduce yourself right now. Thank you. Good morning, Jennifer Alley with the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Good morning, Rebecca Gonzalez with the National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter. Thank you. Good morning, Ben Caldwell, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. Thank you, Ben. Okay, if there are any other entities who would like to introduce themselves, uh, this is the time. I believe we can also open the webinar to do that. Uh, yeah. Right? Um, moderator, if you can please open to see if there are any other agency or entities who would like to introduce themselves that uh, they are watching via webinar today. Thank you. Uh, this is the moderator. I've opened up the Q&A feature uh, for people to um, identify if they are a part of a organization or entity, um, or you can use the raise hand function and then I'll uh, request to meet your microphone so you can introduce yourself. I'll pause a moment to give people time to access those features. Right, and I do have a request um, from Joel McLaftery. Uh, and Joel, I'll request to meet your microphone now. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone. Oh, one second. Uh, Joel, you'll want to click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Um, Joel, it doesn't seem like you are unmuting. I'm going to try one more time to click, um, to request to unmute when the unmute me button appears on your device. You'll want to click that. Um, if not, I'll move on to our next individual and I'll come back to you. So I'll try one more time. Um, doesn't appear that he is unmuting, so I'm going to move on to um, uh, Eleanor, um, and I apologize if I mispronounced your last name, Arube. I'm going to request to unmute, and if you um, click the unmute me button, that'll unmute your microphone. Also appear to not be unmuting. Um, Eleanor, I'm going to request to unmute one more time. Um, see if that prompt appears. You should have a prompt on your computer that uh, says unmute me. You'll want to click the unmute me button. Sarah, this is Kelly. On my end, it looks like, oh, she just oh. unmuted. Never mind. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, this is Eleanor Uribe, and I'm calling in from Fresno, California. And I'm happy to be here and, and see how the meeting goes. So thank you for allowing me to join in. Thank you. Uh, okay, moderator, do we have someone else? Anyone else? Um, we also have uh, Rose Turner. Uh, Rose, I will um, request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears. Hey, good morning. This is Rose Turner from Department of Consumer Affairs, Division of Legislative Affairs. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Right, and then I will try uh, Joel's mic one more time. No. And Joel, you'll want to click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. All right, um, Piers, Joel is not unmuting, so I'm going to move on. It's okay. To, we, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for trying. I appreciate that. I, I'm sure we'll find a way. Thank you. I do, have, I do have one other person who'd like to introduce okay. themselves. Um, uh, Carmen Spears. Newly licensed LP, LPCC, um, also licensed in another state, Maryland. Glad to be here. And thank you. All right, and this is the moderator uh, that appears to be uh, everyone. Would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Yes, thank you, moderator. Thank you so much for all your help. Okay, we are ready to move to our item 11, which is actually my board chair report. And um, first of all, I would like to congratulate 
Justin Hupt and uh, Dr. Annette Walker and Abigail Ortega for being confirmed by the Senate just recently. So congratulations to you all. We're really excited to have you here. Um, I'm also happy to announce that Eleanor Uribe, I hope Eleanor, I haven't mispronounced your last name. I know you, you just spoke to us via webinar that she's also been appointed by the governor to serve as the board's LC's SW board member. And Eleanor has been the faculty field liaison of California State University Fresno since 2012. She worked as a licensed clinical social worker for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations from 2008 to 2012. And she was a social worker practitioner at the Fresno County Department of Social Services from 1994 to 2008. Um, we're looking forward to have you here, Eleanor, so I know you'll be able to introduce yourself. Um, and so thank you so much also for watching today. Um, okay, to the next item, which is, has to do with item B, uh, item A, I'm sorry, for the board members' attendance. Um, you see the report, every time we made um, possible to see uh, about our presence um, to our committees and our board members, because we know they are important, and they are important for also for the public to know who is present and, who we're, and what we are voting on. So I just, uh, you can see the report also for the member of the public, and um, this is through the current fiscal year. Um, so if you believe there are any errors, that perhaps you were present when you were identifiable to be absent, please let us know, let the staff know, and they will be very happy to correct that. So um, the next item are about the future board meeting agenda. Um, you saw an extensive report. I really would like to thank some of my uh, board members here. They brought to our attention, I believe a couple of meetings ago, about really understanding how the whole process works, right? When we make um, a suggestion for a future uh, agenda item, what, what does happen to it and how it's been discussed. So this is a little bit just to um, guide us through the process so that we are as transparent as we need to be. And uh, you'll see that uh, it has to do also with, uh, um, you know, the presentation comes to the, to the board and then the staff and the board chair evaluate if that is an item that's been already addressed before, perhaps we can go back to that. We go back to the person that's made a suggestion in a timely time, sometimes it takes some time, so it could be at the whole, you know, uh, two, three months uh, post the presentation, but the list of pending items that you see are the ones that we're still working on. So I'm not gonna go over each one of those because otherwise it will take half of this board meeting. But um, if there are any questions or any concerns, even about the process or any other suggestions, uh, you're more than welcome to share it now from, from our board. Okay, it seems like we're good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, then we actually are moving to our future. Uh, no. Uh, yes, that one I skipped. Yes, why not, Max? Um, <laughs> so the future, yeah, it's, it's just. I just go the way I feel like it looks like sometimes. Okay, the future board meetings, it's another agenda item in my report that has to do mostly about the dates that we're putting in place for our public to know when we're convening together. Please pay attention to those because obviously uh, it's an opportunity not only for the board members to be present, but also for all our audience so they can organize their time and show up um, in all of the board meeting and the commission, commission um, uh, meetings that will be uh, through web access, so a lot of folks will be able to participate and express their inputs through, um, without even having to be present personally. Um, but for the board meeting, obviously, these are the dates that they are, are, we're going to convene for the next year, up to 2023. Um, any questions about that? Any? We're good? Wonderful. Um, so, uh, we're now moving for, to staff recognitions. We always have amazing um, staff that needs to be recognized. 
Uh, at this time, we would like to recognize Terry Malloy and Joanna Wynn for their service to the board. Terry officially retired from the board this past May, and Joanna will officially retire from the board this coming December. They have both served the board as well as the California Licensed Clinical Counselors for many years. I believe Steve has a few words to share, and um, please go ahead, Steve, and then perhaps we yeah. can have some questions. Yeah, and questions or comments after this, I'm gonna kind of drag it out a little bit here. Uh, because it, it, we're going to have Terry and Joanna on the screen, but I guess uh, they haven't logged in yet or having trouble. So, but we can begin because they can always look at this on the webcast and and get their kudos that way. So, I mean, we want to take um, just like a few moments. Uh, Terry and Joanna have been essential to the operations of the board. Um, they have been. I, I kind of like the the. I don't know, the stalwarts of the LPCC kind of licensing process too, I see. They've, they've served different functions over the years, but really I always see them as our LPCC group. Um, and they were in the initial stages in that and um, have been helping almost, I would say almost all the LPCCs that have gone in through licensure right. um, up, to, to, up to this date. And that's thousands of LPCC licensures. And they've been able to maintain that. It's a pretty complicated process too, and they've worked with the, they've definitely done a great job of working with the associates and working with the uh, people trying to get into the NCMHC exam. So, you know, there's, there's I, I can say a, a ton about it, but I think there's some staff that actually will be giving some comments. Um, they can probably elaborate on that. but. Um, I know that they're enjoying, I believe, I have to check in again, but I know that Joanna was definitely enjoying her time and I think Terry is too. We are all jealous and we definitely miss your, your I, I say tutelage because uh, there's many times they had uh, were able to school me <laughs> in the LPCC process and teach me a lot and, and we're, always, uh, we're always good to, always right there to answer any questions possible. So it looks like we might have somebody on there. Wonderful. Um, and what we uh, what we have, um, Terry and Joanna, uh, we will be presenting you a uh, recognition of service award, and um, and that's just to document. Um, I mean, it's just a small. It's not even really a token, but just a recognition of of how important you were uh, to the board, and and we really do appreciate you know all the time that you served the board. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, so Terry um, has about 22 years of state service and she served for the board since 2001 and her official, her official retire date was June 30th, so she spent a lot of time at the board. Yep. Um, and then additionally, Joanne has oh, more than 15 years of service. I'm going to have to contact you. I hope that's no correction in that because I think <laughs> there might be more, but I apologize if that was a mistake. But she's been working for us since August 2011, so really long service. And um, yeah, so I would open it um, to, oh, Terry is currently on here. So Wonderful. Um, I'm opening up to any comments uh, or if anybody wants to add anything to what I've added. Sure, Steve, and good morning to everyone. Um, I would just like to thank Terry and Joanna just for the service and everything they have provided to the board. Uh, the BBS is a wonderful place to work. It is solely based on the relationships that we've built with the people and the staff. And these two were two remarkable people to be around. Um, it was almost like being around family. So I, I definitely, for Terry, and for Joanna, I want to wish you the best uh, in retirement and, and everything that you do from this point on. And we've definitely appreciated everything that you've brought to the BBS, and you definitely are missed. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. And I'll just add to what um, Marlon said. Terry and Joanna, I've worked with them pretty much my entire time here. Um, we've we've been. They were they were here. Terry was here when I started. Joanna came along shortly after. And I, in my job, the licensing um, evaluators really play a huge role in you know for me letting letting me know how things are working. What is, they're kind of the first on the ground to identify any problems that come up. And both of these ladies have always been a pleasure to work work with. I've enjoyed having them as colleagues and friends. And I 
you guys are already really missed, but I hope you guys are enjoying your retirement. Well, oh, is Terry here also? That is, I don't know. We don't want to put put her on the spot. I don't know. Terry is online, I believe, right now. I think the IS is that Terry. Terry, can you say hi? Oh, how about that? Hello? <laughs> oh, there you are. Hello there. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Sorry we woke you up so early, probably. Oh, no. I'm always <laughs> up early anyway. I don't want to put you on the spot. Is there anything that you Oh, we just like did, that? but yes. <laughs> uh, sure, sure you don't. Um, thank you, guys. Those were really nice words that you said. And um, I do agree that working with the board was um, a really good experience for me. And... Um, I didn't want to go anywhere else. I just liked doing what I was doing and who the people that I worked with. So um, thank you very much. And um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And as a board chair, also uh, perhaps it's weird to say the oldest member. Ouch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, was, I learned really quickly when I joined the board five years ago, I believe, that the importance of the role of the staff in general, but also in particular, um, you, Terry, and Joanne both have made the life of the board possible in relation to all the uh, work that goes behind the scene that sometimes a lot of people don't get to see. Um, you usually get the complaints and you get all the challenges, but not the recognition. So um, we are hoping to do this even more often, not just obviously one hour folks are leaving, but we are always very, very appreciative and we have been throughout of your hard work in supporting each one of us individually and the board as a team because truly um, the consistency of the culture and what it means to be a board member and, and the um, obligations and responsibility and the honor that comes with it, it's possible also through the memories and the expertise and the experience of our staff that they are making it possible for all of us. So we're very and forever grateful for your service and for all of those that are still serving um, you know, in this capacity. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I believe, I don't know, we don't have Joanne on? Um, it's Joe, I don't know if she's actually joined yet. Okay. Uh, can we, and there's comments maybe from on uh, people on Oh the yeah, sure, sure. Yes, and moderator, if you can uh, see if there are any other comments from the public, thank you. Um, before she goes there, this is Lisa Siegelski, the licensing manager, and I just wanna say what a joy it was with working with Terry and Joanne for the short time that I did as licensing manager. However, I did work with them since I came to the board in 2015 and the knowledge that Terry leaves with, um, I hope I gained it all before she left. Um, same with Joanne. They have a lot of knowledge with the LPCC, APCC and um, it's, it's overwhelming at times, all of the information that I had to learn in such a short time, but I really appreciate their guidance that they gave me before both of them left me. Um, and I, it's going to be really hard to fill their shoes. Uh, I wish you guys both well in your retirement. I know you're enjoying grandbabies and kids and all of that. And I can't wait to join you someday in the many in the far future. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there anyone else that the moderator can open the line to? Uh this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q and A feature for uh, people to make comment. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment on this, uh, either click the Q and A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to um, allow people to access that. It looks like Joanne may have joined. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and promote her up to a panelist so she can unmute herself and make any comments that she wishes. Wonderful. Thank you for doing that. Good morning. Good morning. Good boy, we don't want to put you on the spot, Joanna. I don't know if there's anything that you would like to, well, hopefully you're able to hear what we said. If not, um, we were just giving you a lot of kudos for the job well done. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to share? 
Uh, no, but I just say thank you. <laughs> and it, it has been great working with the board and the amazing teams. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Joanne. You're welcome. And thank you uh, both for showing up today on, on the webcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Moderator, are there any? Oh, go ahead. It appears there's no uh, request for comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So thank you again. Um, thank you again, Joanne. And um, so for coming and then also thank you so much for sharing with us also your experience and we're looking forward also to hear more because I know our staff has a lot of stories to share and and um, so thank you so much. Um, I think now we're moving to our next agenda item, right? Oh, okay. So let's see, uh, we are moving to item 12 which is the Department of Consumer Affairs update. And we have actually uh, someone else presenting, which is Joel. Yeah. No, Rose. Oh, Rose Turner. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Rose. Um, so if you would like to introduce yourself, and then we can have the presentation as well. Thank you so much. Moderator, I don't know if you see our speaker and yeah. actually i might be making the assumption rose that you were going to present i'm not sure so no, i apologize I <laughs> okay <laughs> not it's to put me. you in the spot <laughs> <laughs> no thank you so much um good morning everyone again um my name is rose turner and i'm with the uh, division of legislative affairs at bca um thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide the department of consumer affairs update today um First, we have Open Meeting Act legislation. The governor signed Senate Bill 189 on June 30th, 2022, which reinstates through July 1st, 2023, the remote meetings provision of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act that we were in that were in place during the pandemic. The changes took effect immediately upon signing. Please be aware that DCA wants you to have the right meeting for the business of the board while still taking into consideration both costs and public participation. Um, uh, Rose, just a second. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we are having a problem on receiving clarity on the message and understanding. I don't know if, they, if, it's, uh, if the moderator can help us with that, or maybe there are other technical. It's our connection. So, Rose, appears that My perhaps connection? I don't know if you are able to speak louder or sure. it's not coming through. I will try. Um, <laughs> that sounds <laughs> better already. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so the governor signed Senate Bill 189 on June 30th, which reinstates through July 1st, 2023, the remote meeting provisions of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. The changes took effect immediately upon signing. Please be aware that DCA wants you to have the right meeting for the business oh. of the board. Oh, sorry, Rose. We, we're, we're having yeah. trouble um, hearing you again. I guess um, our our tech person says maybe if you slow down, it might help out. Okay. Because it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. No worries. Okay. So. Please be aware that DCA wants you to have oh. the right meeting for the business of the board while still taking into consideration both costs and public participation. We are asking boards to still track the costs for meetings, even those where it isn't where there isn't travel, and also to use WebEx as much as possible to allow the public to attend remotely especially as COVID-19 numbers continue to rise. DCA is still asking boards to complete the public meeting survey to assist in tracking these costs for your board meetings in order to be able to compare costs for in-person and WebEx meetings. Since this legislative change is only in place for this fiscal year. We have distributed the surveys to all boards and bureaus and ask that they be completed within 30 days after each meeting is held. 
Should you have any questions, please reach out to DCA. Though legislation has passed allowing remote meetings, we are reminding boards that choose to hold in-person meetings of the safety measures, best practices, and recommendations for holding public meetings. When planning for upcoming meetings, please remember all board members and staff are expected to follow the state and local public health guidelines that apply in the area where meetings are held. Face coverings are strongly recommended for all board members and staff meetings. The California Department of Public Health strongly recommends that individuals continue to mask in indoor settings. Please post face covering guidance signage at your meeting check-in or entrance. Prior to meeting in person or at a remote location, members need to submit vaccination verification to DCA's Office of Human Resources or be subject to COVID-19 testing. We are pleased to announce the inaugural report of the Enlightened Licensing Project is now available and was distributed to all boards and bureaus on Friday, May 13th. This innovative and collaborative project was started to streamline and enhance licensing processes by utilizing the knowledge and expertise of subject matter experts within DCA boards and bureaus. This project was conducted in partnership with the Board of Registered Nursing. After a thorough assessment of some of BRN's licensing processes, the project's co-chairs provided recommendations to introduce new ideas and to implement best practices for critical licensing activities. DCA held a brown bag event on June 1st to review the recommendations with all boards and bureaus, as we hope that other boards and bureaus can learn from this report and implement recommendations where applicable. We believe it is so important to learn from each other and share our knowledge. We will be turning to enforcement next and will be reviewing the enforcement processes at a board through its enlightenment process, utilizing enforcement subject matter experts. DCA also recently held a brown bag meeting with executive officers and bureau chiefs on July 5th, 2022 to roll out changes to DCA's regulation development and approval processes. These changes were also discussed and approved by DCA's executive officer and bureau cabinet chief cabinet. DCA shared documentation on the process and changes with all boards and bureaus. DCA is pleased to announce that Nicole Lay was hired on June 24th as the Deputy Director of DCA's Office of Administrative Services. With more than 20 years of state service experience, Nicole has dedicated 10 of those years to DCA. Most recently, she served as Acting Deputy Director of OAS, where she was responsible for overseeing the business functions of the Human Resources, Fiscal Operations, and Business Services Offices. Prior to this role, Nicole was chief of the DCA Office of Human Resources. She also previously served at the Contractor State License Board and the Department of Motor Vehicles. We are very excited to have her as part of DCA's executive leadership team. Additionally, Olivia Trejo has been appointed as DCA's chief of the Office of Human Resources as of August 1st. Olivia has over 22 years of human resources experience in state government. And the last nine years have been with the DCA's OHR. She began her career in 2000 at the Department of Insurance, then the Department of Real Estate, and most recently as the DCA Assistant Human Resources Chief for nearly five years. Lastly, Taylor Schick was appointed DCA's Chief Fiscal Officer in July. Taylor has more than 16 years of state experience, all with DCA. Taylor began his career in 2006 as a budget analyst, and most recently as the DCA budget officer. As DCA's chief fiscal officer, Taylor will lead the dedicated accounting and budget team. 
It is with great sadness that we announced some transitions within our board and bureau relations unit. Carrie Holmes, direct, deputy director of board and bureau relations, left DCA on May 13th. Additionally, Brianna Miller has accepted another position and left DCA on June 10th. DCA appreciates the support and service Brianna and Carrie have provided to our boards and bureaus. They have both been a huge asset to the department. I'd like to assure you that during this transitional period, DCA executive office and board and bureau relations will continue to ensure con continuity of services to all DCA boards and bureaus. If you need anything, please contact the DCA member relations email or call the DCA executive office directly. The department was recently advised by the state controller's office that there will be delays in the processing and approval of travel expense claims until the end of July due to setting up the new fiscal year budget in the fiscal system. We appreciate your patience and claims will be processed as quickly as they can once we are able to use the system again. Lastly, board members are required to complete BMOT or board member orientation training within one year of appointment and reappointment. The final training of 2022 will be offered on October 12, 2022. Members can register through DCA's learning management system. Orientation training is required for newly appointed and reappointed members but is advisable as a refresher for all members and executive officers. Reach out to Board and Bureau Relations with any questions. As always, DCA is here to help, and if there is anything we can do to assist, please reach out. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for your effort, and sorry for the initial technical problems. Um, <laughs> We're now moving to item 13 in our agenda, and which is our executive officer report. Steve, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. Good morning. So um, the way we're gonna actually do this, because I know before we kind of have a question about how we go through the questions and stuff, what I'm gonna do is actually go through each item um, and then ask questions from the board for each item. And then at the end, when we get done with everything, uh, we'll be open to the public to ask comments just to make it a little more efficient. Um, because I know we all get those good conversations, but it can drag out this report. So <laughs> thank you for participating. Um, so the first thing is the budget report. And based upon the numbers from June 2022, the board's budget is looking healthy. We currently have spent 81% of our budget of our, it's $13,132,000. And then a review of the board's fund condition reflects an eight month reserve, which is really good. So I don't know if you looked at the charts, but um, yes, our, our reserve is healthy. Are there any questions about the budget report? Nope. nope. Alrighty. Uh, personnel update, uh, there has been a lot of retirements this year, as you, as you heard, Joanna and Terry, but we also had uh, Cassandra Kearney retire um, in June also. She wasn't able to make it today, so we might be honoring her later on in November if I can coax her to come in. Um, <laughs> she's enjoying her time off though, I believe. And currently right now we have uh, 11 vacancies, um, but I can happily report this week after this, after this report was published, um, we have a new um, licensing uh, LMFT lead, and that is Robert Esquivel. Um, unfortunately, not unfortunately, congratulations Robert, unfortunately that's gonna leave us uh, another position to fill in enforcement, but that's always a good thing when it's kind of, it's, it was somewhat of a, not really a promotion, but he really um, has thrived in the licensing area, so he wanted to continue that. So congratulations, Robert. And then also we have, uh, we have Sparkle Moss coming to us, and she's going to be the lead APCC and LPCC evaluator. So that's really cool. So um, we are staffing up, and I'm hopefully by November I'll be able to report we only have one or two, maybe zero <laughs> vacancies. So... <laughs> Any questions on the personnel? No questions, but I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. I know the name Sparkle. Oh, the, uh, the like, Sparkle Moss. Yes, I, she's a, 
she comes from board of registered nursing, so she has um, uh, she has the knowledge too of a lot of like the breeze and processes too. So that'll be good. So I have not met her yet, but can't wait to see. Okay. Then the licensing report. Um, currently, we have a population of 130,343 licensees. That includes 38, around 38,000 registrants and around 92,000 licensees. Um, there were less licenses issued this quarter. Uh, in the total, the board issued 14,978 license, licenses this year, and that includes 9,000, around 9,000 registrations and around 5,800 licenses. So um, we continue to grow. It's a 1% increase, it seems like, every quarter and every year. So um, that is not slowing down. And during this quarter, we received a 38% increase in applications. And that's not uncommon. It's, it's cyclical, most of those applications. If you, if you looked at the report, there's a, I think it was a 200% almost increase in the ASW exams, but it's the graduation season and uh, we're getting in there. It's interesting, um, the, the cycles have changed just a tad bit, I think, because of the COVID, we're trying to figure that out. So hopefully we're getting kind of back to normal so we can really adjust for those. Um, next, ASW, ASW applications were, or the registrant applications were high this, this um, quarter, and I expect that the MFTs actually increase next quarter is kind of the way it's been going. So we'll see a, a greater increase probably in those next quarter. Um, the other thing to note too, we, I started tracking really the out-of-state applications and on the yearly uh, tallies, we can definitely see an increase in those out-of-state applicants coming in, um, especially this last year. So I don't expect that to slow down. That should only increase also. Um, because of the increased workload, our processing times have increased um, across the board. And um, they're not too far. I actually should have made a more, uh, looked at that closer, but they're not too far from the established uh, timelines that we want to reach. Um, honestly, I want to reach 30 days is what I, for everything, but we will work on that. Um, 60 days is usually is the established time frame that we would do the licensure applications and those are the applications that go, uh, allow somebody to take the clinical exam that they need to for licensure. Um, that's 60 days in the registrant applications. Um, the goal is to get those processed in 30 days. Um, and I'm thinking we are, we are over that right now, but um, they are working hard to clean those up. Uh, the one thing that I do note is LCSW, the application for licensures. Uh, we had a backlog in that. Um, we had staff leave now that we're fully staffed in that unit. Um, we are getting back down to a normal time frame. And I think all of our applications are currently, we're processing either in the applications received mid-June or later. Yeah, later. Um, so um, we're doing pretty good. So those will be those will be expedited more. And the other thing I mentioned on this too uh, for out-of-state registrants, it's a little bit easier um, if somebody's coming in with a license from another state and they do pass. We call it pass A. Mm -hmm. um, what the licensing unit is doing is um, segregating those a little bit to make to process those quicker because it's just faster and just to get that workload done. So Lisa has been working with their staff to kind of uh, work through that. So that helps out with processing times. Um, I have uh, posted the stats for the four years. As you can see there, um, eventually, hopefully, I'll get some charts for you so it looks a little prettier. Um, but right now, there's are the, there are the numbers. Um, you can see, in general, there is increase overall. We did have a dip last year, but once again, with COVID, it's, it's really hard to, to tell what's, what's normal in that year. So I am expecting everything to keep increasing as an application, um, definitely in application volumes. So, but hopefully we can match that with a decrease in processing times. Right. So we'll work on that. Any questions? Thank you, Steve. Any questions for this? I see a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been talking a while about trying to do some cross-training within the processing teams. Have you been able to move forward on that to try and bring those days down? Yeah, in the, uh, in the licensing unit teams, um, 
The licensing unit teams, um, Lisa has been uh, starting that actually and starting to cross train. So it has been implemented. Yep, I, I can't take credit for that, Lisa. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> and so I think the next part is actually we're looking at the registrant desk. Um, we have to get a little bit um, staffed up in there um, and then start doing that cross training also. And the other thing we're doing for registrant desk is really looking, we're taking a hard look at the actual processes. And so um, within the next months, um, we'll be standardizing the process and make sure that we have the best possible, you know, possible way, uh, po best standard practices, I guess. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, Ross? <laughs> a quick question going back to the um, budget update real quick. The mm -hmm. personal ex personal services, 42%, what, what would fall under the category of personal services? Uh, personal services are the um, staff, the, the salaries and um, benefits and stuff, all that, anything that has to do with staffing. Operating. Operating, the, the operating and equipment, um, yeah, is kind of the building and facilities and um, other, th I think other things included in there, kind of like breeze payments, stuff that we um, pro rata for the, for the DCA and such, so. Any other questions on licensing as well? Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Moving on. Um, examination uh, report. It's a pretty hefty report. I, we rarely, <laughs> usually not much to report on exams, but um, there seems to be a lot of activity with the national exams. And, um, but just for the, we had, did have an increase in exams administered this quarter. We had eight exam workshops that were conducted. Three of those workshops were done in person and five remotely. I know that uh, OPS is still considering doing that remote work. Um, we're working with, they have been in cons consultation with us as to, you know, maybe doing more in person or not. Um, some of those, some of those exam workshops really do, do uh, work better in person. So they do some of those still. Um, I'm reporting that the, in November, the National Board of Clinical Counselors will be launching a new format for the National Clinical Mental Health Counselors Exam, the NCMHCE. I'll quiz you guys on that later to see if you can remember that acronym because it's great. Um, so that is the exam that all uh, licensed professional clinical counselors have to take to become licensed. Uh, this new exam will emphasize long-term ongoing therapeutic processes of the process of, of the counseling relationship. Um, in general, the exam will include 11 case studies, 10 which will be scored. Candidates will be given a client's diagnosis at the start of each case, and each clinical narrative of 13 will have 13 multiple choice questions with four options and only one correct answer. So um, I can provide more information on this uh, possibly. I think I, I, I kind of, I, I want to do more information on this at the next meeting so you can see. Um, but there is an attached just kind of a comparison chart of what the current exam looks like and what the new exam will look like. Um, if you have any questions, definitely reach out. Um, we are posting, we have posted this on our normal channels of social media and listserv to let candidates know and we'll be doing a follow-up um, kind of email blast and such in September just to make sure everyone is aware of that. The other thing that we'll be discussing a little bit later, I kind of wanted to bring this out of, into another discussion point, is the NBCC has um, partnered with Pearson View to provide online proctoring for the, for the NCMHCE exam, and that begins in November. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Any questions on the exam? Yes, Dr. Walker. Just really quick, on my notes here, it could be me, but I um, noted that it's an at-home exam, the new format. Is that the M MB yes. okay, MBCC? Correct. Okay, this is the obvious testing, okay. Yeah, and we'll be talking a little bit more, yeah, more Please. in depth on that later. So okay, I just want to clarify. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Oh, just to clarify too, it's, it, it, what the concept is, is it'll be virtual or depending on what the candidate wants. So, but we'll talk about more. Um, oh, I still got some more actually, ASWB, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm trying to get off. So ASWB, the Associated Social Work Boards, um, 
the OPS has completed a comprehensive review of their national exam, and that is the exam that social workers need to take to become licensed in California. And this report was completed in May 2022. Um, they, uh, OPES found that the procedures used to establish and support the validity and defensibility of the examination met professional guidelines and technical standards outlined in the standard for educational and psychological testing and the California Business and Profession Code 139. Um, since they, they do agree that they fully comply with B, and OPS agreed that, or found that ASWB fully complied with BNP Code 139, um, but they did recommend that they might look at phasing out the service of, uh, the service of educators in the examination development process. I'll have to read furthermore. I, I, I can't speak to necessarily why um, the report was doing that, but it's a suggestion. But overall, they, they, the exam passed the, uh, passed the review in, in essence. And um, I think uh, I'm probably, with these discussions, um, I should have probably provided more uh, information on what the California Business and Profession Code 139 is. Um, I'll possibly pull that out for the next examination, but it's the DCA um, had to, has to, had to establish a process for looking at the validity of each exam that the boards use for their licensing process. And it lays out some guidelines for how they have to report that when you have to do an occupational analysis and when a review is due. So um, this was done because it was an occupational, every five years or six years, you usually do an occupational analysis to look to see if your exam questions or exam content is still viable, and so that's why we looked at the ASWB exam this year, because it's been a couple years since we looked at it before. Um, one thing additionally I didn't note in the report um, last week, ASWB did release demographic data of their exam pass rates, so that was interesting. I haven't had a chance to actually look at it yet. I will be reporting more on that next time. So any questions, what, hold on. <laughs> Let me go through this one more. LPCC, that's another exam question, another exam part two. We did have an issue with the LPCC law and ethics exam. Uh, a new version of the exam was uploaded for the exam vendor Pearson View on May 2022, and OPES did a routine, or they, they are consistently monitoring the exams, but during the routine analysis, they, re, they saw a question that may have not been performing correctly. Um, the result of the statistical analysis determined a rescore for the exam was necessary for 157 candidates who attempted the exam between May 1st, 2022 and June 3rd, 2022. Um, all candidates reflected a failed exam attempt on that. Um, so we went back, um, reloaded, worked with uh, OPS and Pearson View, and 126 of the scores were adjusted from failed to pass. Um, the remaining 31 attempts were still remained as failed. So um, all 157 candidates were notified by, uh, by email of the statistical analysis and rescore, and the corrected version was uploaded and uh, put in place on June 4th. So, so Steve, was, sorry, I don't know if I, uh, was Peerview able to share a little bit what happened? Um, um, I hadn't delved into that. Usually what it could have been on this issue, it could have been just a score of, um, we're looking at the statistical analysis, so they may have, OPS may have determined that, you know, a score if, if they, and I can't fully, you know, talk to how they look at it, but I mean, the way I look at it is they saw a score that for some reason everyone was failing on then it's something to look at. That's, that's kind of an anomaly in the, in the test. So I think that might have been the issue. So, yeah. I'm, I'm sure the staff will do the follow-up. So I'm oh, yeah. confident that it would be nice to hear from them as well because it, it, it might yeah, create distrust in the process. Okay. So yeah. sure. And another thing I, I wanted to point out, I know it's in the report that as June 30, 2022, all waivers extensions have ended. So just for the record for the public, so they understand that the COVID-related wave it, mm -hmm. that the state of California has put in place. Correct, for all the exams. We had exam extensions mm -hmm. for those. So those are, those are well over. We only have one, uh, one, actually, we don't really mention this anywhere, but yes, we do have the one waiver, just to clarify. I'll, I'll talk about that in the ledge update. Okay, perfect.
Wonderful. I won't Thank talk you, about Ben. Another. Thank you. Any uh, any exam questions? Okay. Great. Next, the enforcement report. There is little change in the consumer and criminal complaint stats for this third quarter. I mean, for uh, in this fourth quarter. Uh, for, in total for the year, the board received 3,043 complaints and closed around 1,700 complaints. The average days it takes to complete formal discipline on an average for the year is 506 days. The average number of days that a case is at the Attorney General's office is 360 days. And the average to complete a board investigation, that's our staff, is 33 days. We currently have six petitioners waiting to be scheduled and we have received four petitions this fiscal year so far. So um, it looks like it's gonna be pretty busy with the petitioners. So we'll have to, um, I'll be talking with the board chair and vice chair <laughs> about how to coordinate that and how we're gonna to proceed to ensure that we do not get a backlog in petitioners. Did our latest uh, choice about speeding up the process in regards to how many cases we have in the backlog help a little? It did we help. Don't have data? Well, it did help. It actually, yeah, it really did help. Um, but we have to, yeah, so it was good. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions on that, on the enforcement report? Okay. Then next, education and outreach. Um, once again, we have a healthy social media presence. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently have two, two, about 2,000 Facebook followers and our Facebook had a page had a 29% increase in visits. The Consumer Information Center uh, answered 3,444 calls for us last quarter with an average wait time of 52 seconds. And board staff have handled approximately 25,000 emails last quarter. Um, that's something that we're actually starting to track more and that's 25,000 emails. That's, there's still some um, email boxes that we're not tracking in that. So um, Marlon and I have done a, a, we're really looking at tracking every single piece of workload we have in the office so that we can really see what what we need for staffing. So that was 25,000 emails and um, it'll definitely help us start tracking that. It will help us to see when we make these changes to either social media or our communication, if that is actually helping us. So any, um, and then pathway to licensure. Uh, we have uh, completed three scripts and uh, these videos are currently being developed by the Office of Public Affairs. I'm excited to say that Cesar is actually working with us, I think, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so that'll be good. And those are basically um, videos to describe some of the processes and how to get through the licensure process. Uh, we have 12 videos that we're looking at right now to produce, um, and they will go into more detail. The first one that we're going to produce is a general path, a general pathway description for really fits with anybody going through the process, whether you're an LPCC, an AS, LCSW, or LMFT. Um, and then the other ones will actually get closer in and, and talk more about like the education requirements for each of the different license types. So we're hoping that we'll have those posted sometime. I don't know, maybe this year? Yeah, maybe, maybe this year, so. And then, um, so that is, I believe, it for the education and mm -hmm. outreach. Any questions on that? No, doesn't look like. No. Okay. <laughs> Next thing is, is the uh, next on the agenda is the organizational development um, report. Uh, what I report for the Breeze is we have um, currently the board staff and completed 17 updates to the Breeze system. Um, the most notably is we just completed the testing and approval of the, um, uh, the online supervisor's assessment um, component. So that should be going online soon so the uh, supervisors can do that task online. Um, Marlon's been doing a lot of that. So thanks Marlon for keeping up on, we've been getting a lot of uh, paper and emails coming in. Um, so, which is good. I'm happy to see that people are actually filling it out. So good job. Thank you out there. Um, listening sessions, uh, we had talked about doing two listening sessions. One's, one was for the telehealth committee or telehealth and another one is for um, the barriers to licensure. Um, so the first one we were starting with was for the telehealth listening session. Um, and in June, we put out a 
we put out a survey uh, to everyone, and the intent of the survey was really to collect more information about telehealth to see what concerns people may have. And additionally, it did offer the opportunity for people to at, say that the, or people to offer a presentation at the listening session. So of, we did receive 1,211 responses, which was pretty good. And 30 responders noted that they would be willing to present during the session. Um, when we started to look at it, though, the majority of the offers to present did not address specific concerns or problems, but rather offered to share, you know, telehealth benefits in general, as well as offering suggestions for best practices. Uh, based on this, we had a lot of discussions um, with the team, and we believe that some of these presenters may be able to assist us and provide their expertise in two uh, specific topic areas that the committee will be focusing on, the telehealth committee will be focusing on, and that's the development of the best practice document and an examination of existing and emerging types of telehealth platforms. So what we are intending to do is um, switching this over to um, like a committee presentation and looking at talking to the people that have actually offered to present information and tapping into their expertise by actually talking to them and gaining that information and then we'll see how we can actually incorporate that into a telehealth meeting and maybe have them present there and have a different focus possibly for the telehealth um, you know to help us guide the focus of the telehealth committee and that's it for that outreach. I mean, that was the organizational development report. Any questions there? No. Okay. Not from the board. And actually, if that concludes your report, maybe we can open to the public. That concludes my report. So uh, we can open to the public, and, and definitely uh, we will begin with the people that are present here in Sacramento. If there are any questions in relation to the executive report that was just um, share with us from Steve, Ben. Sorry, my leg fell asleep. <laughs> oh, uh, ben, please introduce yourself as always. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, ben Caldwell, LMFT. And just uh, two quick questions about the enforcement report. Um, the first is just about reading that chart. It shows 700 to 800 complaints and convictions received in a typical quarter, and then it looks like about 500 to 500 cases are typically closed. Those other categories, I assume, are not mutually exclusive. Um, just curious about what happens to cases that don't fall into that closed category, but don't appear in other categories either. Uh, are those cases that are never opened? Do they reflect multiple complaints on the same issue or something else? I'm just wanting to make sense out of those numbers. That's actually a really good question. Um, Marlon, can you speak to that possibly? Yeah. Can you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I'm clear on exactly. Oh, I don't know that I understand it. Okay. But I'll, <laughs> I'll try. Just so, um, it's, it's just about so that if you put the complaints and convictions together in a typical quarter, that would be 700 to 800 sort of issues that uh, are received for potential enforcement. It looks like 500 to 550 are closed in a typical quarter. Those other categories, they're not sort of mutually exclusive, but they show progress through the, the enforcement process. What happens to the rest? So the other cases may just be pending. Okay. So again, so all consumer complaints uh, that are received, they are going to be investigated. Uh, and then at some point, whether it's closed or if it's referred to the AG's office or we take some sort of administrative action, you know, we'll make a notation of that. But the ones that may, I think that you may be referring to, they may just be pending at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other thing is, is just a request for future reports. Could you include data on people's progression through the probation process? I know it's something we've talked about a little bit previously. Um, you have numbers on like petitioners for uh, early termination of, of probation, um, but it would be interesting to see how many people are actually completing the process and if possible, um, compare that to the number of folks in each quarter who have chosen to surrender their license or registration rather than complete the process. Just more, more useful data. Oh yeah, no, definitely. And uh, yeah, I've mentioned that before. We are we have the discussions going on now. It's kind of looking at that because I think it would it would be good to kind of present that information. I, I'm interested myself too because we don't really have that overall view of of the uh, you know the population of probationers and what happens. So, 
Definitely. Thank you, Ben. Are there any other members of the public that are present here that would like to speak to the report? No? Okay, uh, moderator, if we can open to the public that is connected via, via web, that would be great to see if there are any comments on this agenda item. As a moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public on WebEx, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Right, and it appears there are no requests for comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Okay, and that will conclude the agenda item. Steve, any other addition to it? So we can move on to our item 14 in the agenda, which is the discussion of the National Board of Clinical Counselors use of OnView online uh, proctoring. Um, I know, Steve, we, you will introduce this item, so thank you again. So the National Board of Clinical Counselors, they are the organization that works with the clinical counsel, uh, CC, I should have had that, I'm sorry, the acronym, the Counselor Certification and Education uh, Group. Um, they, they, the CCE actually developed the exams for NBCC. I forgive all the acronyms, but I just want to explain it. So. <laughs> NBCC, governing agency, um, they work with CCE in developing the National Clinical Mental Health Counselor Examination, the NCMHCE. Um, so they, NBCC has actually, it, it, it has a contract with Pearson View, um, and they've been delivering the exam for, uh, for NBCC, I mean, since we began using it. Uh, this, the thing that we're discussing today, though, is they have recently made a decision to utilize Pearson View's OnView system, which is a online proctoring system, so that the actual candidate can take the exam in a remote location, I would assume their home or somewhere else, and they can do that online. And it's going to be an offer, and that's going to be offered to candidates starting in November. Mm -hmm. So um, w that was brought to our attention. We reached out to OPS and, um, and, and luckily OPS is here, so I hope I don't butcher your, your thoughts, but let me explain. Uh, they, they, although the initial research you know, indicates that remote proctoring resulted may, may result in standardized pass rates and may be okay, it in you know it does offer there's some concerns and there's uh, concerns about uh, you know new new ways for exam subversion or other legal issues um, the 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 legal issues such as uh, policies addressing and sharing personal information or the use of video surveillance so there's some issues that uh, OPS was concerned about which I think are definitely valid and we do need to take into concern. Um, so what we will be doing is working with NBCC and OPES, and I want to uh, hold some meetings with uh, Pearson View's test, uh, Pearson View NBCC with OPES is my is what I want to try to get to get going. Um, since uh, Pearson View though is it's really NBCC's contract, I have to work that out to see if we can talk to them more in depth about the system. Um, I mean, my personal views, I, I definitely see that it does offer, you know, for sub, sub possible subversion and such. Uh, I did just attend the NBCC conference where Pearson View did give an overview of the security measures that they do put in place um, for the exam. And part of it is um, that, you know, when they originally, the, the candidate gets into the exam, they have to take a picture of their ID, they have to do a facial recognition picture. Then they have to actually do a scan of the room that they're in. Um, once that is complete and the proctor actually verifies that everything's good to go, um, then the artificial intelligence, it'll be a combination of artificial intelligence and online proctoring that will hopefully secure, make it secure. Um, the, 
the one question that um, Pearson, uh, that OPS had, which I think is, I need to really do research, is I'm kind of concerned is how many proctors are available per each exam candidate. Um, so the way that it was explained uh, in the demonstration I saw is the AI would, you know, alert the online proctor if, if things looked um, suspicious, such as you, your, your face leaves the camera, you have something else enters the camera, um, it, it's pretty. It's it's pretty amazing what they can do. Um, but not that again, though. It's pretty amazing if somebody wants to subvert it. So what they can do too. Um, it, their intent, though, is to keep um, strengthening the uh, security of that, and they have other things that they're working on, um, different AI aspects and such. So. I think um, I might try to see if we can have that conversation there and get the presentation at the next board meeting so that we can see that too, because it was a good presentation. Um, so where we stand right now, uh, it's moving forward in November, um, and uh, I think we just need to want to move forward. Hopefully we can work with OPS to see, um, you know, what, if they feel that it, it, it's okay. Um, trying to work out. So I'll let you speak, though. Actually, you can be more speaking. Uh, you can actually more eloquently state your concerns, and I'd appreciate that. So um, honestly, right now, I just wanted to see a kind of this conversation was just kind of an open discussion as to uh, what the concerns are of the board members. Um, so I can take that away and then concentrate on that when we when we kind of do more investigation with uh, NBCC and OPS. I, I just would like to share something. I remember at the beginning of the COVID crisis, I mean, this was a constant uh, comments and presence in our co public comments where people were concerned about the possibility opportunities to do exam remotely. And I'm impressed in how fast we went, in, you know, considering all the circumstances has been uh, the first time I heard of is um, barely three years, it's not even, and considering how much can go into it, even the possible risks, I think we're doing, we're doing the right thing, um, but obviously it, it, taking in consideration the, consideration of the possible challenges that comes with it, we will find out as we go. Um, I know that other states ever implemented similar, uh, I remember in, in a report that was shared with us maybe over a year ago, um, there are a few states that implemented sim similar um, technology, but um, I think it's where we're heading, and the more we can uh, look into it and the more data we have, the better we'll, we will deliver a product that will allow people to really mm -hmm. do this remotely. So we'll break, break down a lot of barriers, that's for sure, the, you know. Um, but yeah, it's still ongoing. And I mean, the one thing to consider too, yeah, it's mm -hmm. still, and, the, and like I said, Pearson View keeps learning, keeps bettering right. the process. Um, the, MB, the NCMAC is used by all states, and I'm not sure if anybody else has actually raised a concern over the online proctoring, not to say we shouldn't. Um, so that's one thing to take into consideration. And additionally, this is kind of ad hoc, for, I, I'm, Hopefully I can, these are a general overview of the stats though. I believe they, they do actually, uh, NBCC has a certification exam, which is a little, it's like bachelor's uh, level exam that they have been doing online proctoring for, for at least a year now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we asked, uh, like my concern was, or my thought is too, is, is everyone really gonna wanna do this online? I know some people would probably not want to do that. I know I wouldn't with the barking dog and the kids running around, wouldn't be the best way for me to take an exam. Um, but it, through them, is 14% of the people, and I think it was around 10,000 candidates took advantage of the online proctoring. Um, the other thing that was of concern for me too is really the system requirements that uh, people might have or that have to have to do the online proctoring. Um, they do a system test and they, you have to do a system test before you even get to the exam process. Um, so they make sure that works and then the day of you also have to do a system test just to make sure that you have the ability to do that. That's another thing. I mean, if you don't have the ability, are we keeping people away from doing the online proctoring, is that not a good thing? Um, so, uh, but they do, um, 
just to make sure that they don't have those issues during the test or where it shuts down and such. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Okay. So, thank you, Steve. Are there any comments from our board members? Yeah, I, I see Abigail. I'm still curious to see that presentation and like what technology is out mm -hmm. there because um, I'm just thinking like, are they going to verify like? That um, that the person is who they say they are, other than just like showing an ID, right, on on the camera, which is not always accurate. Um, and then I was thinking like facial recognition technology, but then like we also know that that's not always accurate. So yeah, looking forward to that presentation. Okay. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, when you speak, introduce yourself just for the record. But thank you, Abigail. Um, anyone else from the board? Otherwise, we're moving to the uh, our members in the audience that they are present here. Are there any comments as they, on this item, agenda item? <laughs> Excellent. <Sorry>. Wonderful. <laughs> and thank you for being present. <laughs> oh, just, Dr. Walker, I'm sorry I missed I'll you. I'll be really quick. Just, just a thought that I'm, I'm glad we're moving in this direction to offer options, flexibility, and things like that, so I'm all for it. And there are... Um, we're not the first person to attempt this. There are other, you know, folks that are doing this right now and it's effective. So we have other models to look to. Exactly. Um, so I was just thinking for our purposes um, that once we start this, that we make sure that we capture the pros and cons. Just to, I'm sorry, and this is a Net Walker public member, just to make sure that we keep the public informed on just, you know, how it's working and where it is. Thank you. Thank you, uh -huh. Dr. Walker. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. It's off while I'm speaking. Good morning. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tracy Montez, Division Chief of Programs and Policy um, and OPS, the Office of Professional Examination Services, is a unit in my division. So I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on some of the comments that we've heard in our memo. Um, I do want to um, state for the record um, that both OPS and the department do not support remote proctored testing at this time for high stakes licensing exams. Mm -hmm. We feel the technology is still new. We're going to equate it to like a Tesla and the self-driving came out. Everybody's really excited. And now we know there's some problems with it. So much like remote proctoring, we know that artificial intelligence has created some problems. We know uh, individual technology creates some um, unfair advantage depending upon if you can afford to have the right bandwidth, equipment, things like that. Um, so there's also standardization is the environment that you're taking it in, in your home or wherever, the same as if you were at a Pearson View site. So there's a lot of what we would call error floating around that can impact the process. So while we think it's definitely in the future, you know, definitely something we need to move forward toward, we really want to caution our regulatory boards with jumping ahead too quickly. Um, just be aware that if you do have a vendor or an association that uses this, that you monitor it closely and you be aware of these things because I'm currently on the Blue Ribbon Commission for the Future of the State Bar Exam and they are having some problems with remote proctoring and some lawsuits. So it, it's it's new. It's new and shiny. It's it's something, yes, we're going to get there, but just please be careful as you make these decisions and it's not just a, you know, yes, we want to be supportive of our candidates. We want to get them licensed, but remember consumer protection, fair, valid, and legally defensible exams. And again, we're happy to work with the board and help you move toward that goal of having exam options. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for your input. Are there any other comments from the members of the public? No, then I will ask for our moderator to go and open to our people that are, they are on the web. Thank you, moderator, please. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access those features and submit their requests.
All right, uh, and it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you, moderator. And I would like to actually suggest a 10 minutes break, if it's okay. It's 10.22 and we're reconvening back at 10.32 before we start our next item agenda. Thank you.